Okay, men's prayer breakfast this Saturday morning, and that's at 7.30, so uh, bring some guys who don't normally come. It's been a little s- slim lately. Also, we have, uh, we're going to have our Independence Day barbecue on Sunday, July 3rd. And we're going to provide, the church is going to provide brisket, and we're asking families to bring a side dish and dessert, and then vacation Bible schools on July 19th to the 21st. So we're going to have an interesting time that weekend because we're going to have a couple of different, we're going to have some visitors, Mark and Karen Musser, Rachel will be here that Sunday, of course, for his graduation, and then uh, Sergei Yakubchek who is Jim's driver in Ukraine, uh, got out, of course. He got out before the war started because he went skiing. But that got him out because otherwise... And then he found a way to his sisters in Seattle, and he's so glad to be coming to Texas. Because he's... You know, these Ukrainians can smell a socialist a hundred miles off, and they don't like it. So he's up there in Seattle, so he's, uh, he is very glad he's going to be coming down to Texas. So he'll be here for about a week. He's bringing Mark Musser's car down, so that'll be good. But we'll have some different people uh, here during that, that time. Probably some of our people, a three-day weekend will be gone. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer, so you can make sure you're in right relationship with the Lord, uh, described as walking by the Spirit, which is a great image for understanding what fellowship is. Fellowship is that intimacy between two people who are going in the same direction, accomplishing the same mission. So that is what fellowship is all about as we are studying. So we'll have a few moments of silent prayer so you can make sure you're spiritually prepared. Then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful we can be here tonight where we can come together, we can study your word, we have the freedom to meet, to study, to freely pro- proclaim the truth of your word, and then to go out as missionaries to the world around us, where we can shine as lights in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation. Father, we pray for this nation. We know that we are on a decline, and that uh, it's very unusual in history for there to be a a uh, return to biblical values. It has happened. It will happen again, but it may not happen here. And we need to be spiritually prepared for whatever does happen, especially in a worst-case scenario. And so, Father, we need to know your word. We need to have our souls fortified by your word, and we need to practice uh, trusting you, claiming promises day in and day out. We pray that we might be encouraged to do so and encouraged in our walk as we study tonight. In Christ's name, amen. All right, open your Bibles to Philippians. Philippians chapter 1, and we're looking at the development of this important concept of partnership in the gospel that comes right out of of the uh, fifth verse. For your fellowship, our partnership, for the gospel is how it should be translated. I, did, I just copied that from the text. It is not related to salvation. It is related to the function of the gospel ministry. 
in re- because they are supporting Paul so that he can do what he needs to do in taking the gospel where the Lord directs him. So we've looked at these two verses to some degree last week, mostly in light of a comparison and contrast between the opening introduction, which goes down through uh, verse 11 in terms of the formal introduction, and then down through verse 18 sort of brings us into a more personal introduction in verses 12 through 18 before we get into the main uh, body. Actually, it's more like 12 through uh, 26, and then... Starting in 27, there's the main body of this epistle. Now, all of those kinds of things seem, I don't know whether they seem kind of uh, off or why do we spend so much time on those kinds of things when we're looking at the beginning of a book. And that is because we need to understand what he's talking about. Just like when we get in, we go somewhere and you see some people you know, and you walk up in the middle of a conversation, and you overhear what they're saying, and what's the first thing you're doing in your mind? What are they talking about? And you don't really know what the conversation is, sort of like when you may overhear a conversation in the house, somebody else is on the phone, and all of a sudden something is said, what are they talking about? And you start guessing. And you'll guess, oh, they're t- they must be talking about this thing or that restaurant or a movie or something they read in the paper. And then when you get a little more information and a little more information, you suddenly realize your initial guess was way off that they're not talking about that at all. They're talking about something completely different. And in in more formal study of hermeneutics, that's what's called a heurism, which is just a fancy word for making a guess. And so when you read through a book in the Bible, you're asking this question, what's he really talking about? I don't understand this. And all the parts of an epistle all feed into the main theme. And if the main theme is X, and you think they're talking about Z, and you interpret difficult or ambiguous passages within, um, within the epistle as relating to X, and he's really talking about Z, then you're going to be off base in your interpretation. It doesn't mean that you're in heresy, There's all kinds of people who have used all kinds of verses over the centuries to say this teaches that. What they're saying it teaches is biblical, but it's not what's in that passage. And that happens a lot. Sometimes I thought I'd like to do a series on all the famous theologians and preachers through the ages who got saved by some verse that has absolutely nothing to do with salvation. So God the Holy Spirit is able to work around our inabilities to truly perceive what is being said. But it's important when you get into an epistle like Philippians, and Philippians is notorious for being difficult. There's all kinds of people you have. um, uh, You have all kinds of books uh, that have been published by different scholars, some saying the theme of Philippians is, is joy. Others say the theme of Philippians is is how you should think. The other people say the theme of Philippians is related to uh, justification. And other people say, well, he's just talking, it's just a friendly letter. He's talking about all kinds of different things. Does that remind you of any other epistle? It ought to remind you of James, although I thought that for most of you, you haven't heard me teach James, but James is often, you read in commentaries, this is like the Proverbs of the New Testament. And there's nothing unifying, it's just a series of unrelated topics that are brought together. But that's, that's not right. Every, and this is one of the challenging things, I think, personally, as a pastor and a student of the Word, is trying to discover in some of these epistles what that unifying theme is. And I've, uh, over the years, I've thought that Philippians is about joy, and then it's about this, about that. And 
uh, just in terms of the study I've done in the last three or four weeks, realizing that it has to do with this partnership in the gospel. Everything in it that's here can come under that theme. That doesn't mean there's a lot there about unity, and that there's a lot there about humility, there's a lot there about um, joy, but those are secondary ideas to the main idea of, of this epistle. And once you get that, it's amazing how many things are more understandable if you just realize what it is that, that they're talking about. So that's what we looked at last time, this concept of the fellowship in the gospel. And so that is what Paul is thankful for in this opening prayer. I thank my God, and then you skip verse 4, and verse 5 begins, for your fellowship, your partnership, your participation, that's what koinonia means, in or for the gospel for the first day until now. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, how that develops. And so we looked at these two questions last time. For what is Paul thankful? He's thankful for their partnership in the gospel. And for what is he confident? Is he talking about salvation or is he our sanctification, or maybe something else? And uh, usually people take it that he's taught the good work is regeneration to glorification. And we talked about the different phases or stages of salvation. Uh, phase one is, is uh, justification, when we trust Christ as Savior, then we have Phase two, which is sanctification or the spiritual life, spiritual growth, and then glorification. In justification, we're saved from the penalty of sin, so we don't go to the lake of fire. In the spiritual life, we're saved from the power of sin in this life, but it's not until glorification that we'll, we're saved from the presence of sin. And so we saw that there are two forms here of sanctification where people approach that. One is that in a more broad sense, general sense, God graciously works in the believer's life to enable them to grow if they are willing. That is one that is, that is consistent with a free grace gospel. It's not a strong statement that they will necessarily grow if they are truly saved. That's the stronger Calvinist perseverance position. The second option is that uh, is the Calvinist lordship position. A genuine believer in Jesus Christ who is truly regenerate will persevere in faith and good works until God glorifies them following their death or the rapture. Now, this is articulated uh, clearly in a Reformed, that means Calvinist, Reformed Confession of Faith or Doctrinal Statement for the um, uh, French uh, Huguenots, 1559, states, We believe also that faith is given to the elect. Notice, if faith is not the product of your volition, God gives faith, saving faith to those who are the elect. Not only to introduce them into the right way, but also to make them, notice that language, make them continue in it to the end. In other words, if you don't continue, if you fail as a believer and you decide after some years to, that you're just going to go off and do your own thing and you go into some sort of backsliding period and you die, oh, then you weren't ever saved. You didn't persevere to the end. And it goes on to say, For as it is God who begins the work, he gives the faith, he regenerates, actually in their order, he regenerates you and then he gives you the faith. And so then you will persevere to the end. John MacArthur, who is probably the most widely known and popular ex, um, exponent of lordship salvation, which is another term for this Calvinist view of, of um, perseverance, says that uh, that ongoing work of grace in the Christian's life is, 
is as much a certainty as justification, glorification, or any other aspect of God's redeeming work. Now, we know that our glorification is certain, but we don't know that our spiritual growth is certain unless you hold to a Calvinist form of perseverance. So he goes on to say, salvation is wholly God's work, and he finishes what he starts. His grace is sufficient and potent, and it cannot be defective in any regard. In other words, if you fail, then you weren't ever truly saved. Now, the reason MacArthur reached that conclusion was an experiential thing, because he started off with a solid free grace gospel. And it, later in life, he, he started reading the Puritans a lot, and he became convinced of what Jody uh, Dillo calls their experimental predestination, which meant you really didn't know if you were predestined and elect unless you looked at the experiment of your life, as it were, and if you see the right fruit, if you have the right evidence, then you can maybe say that you're saved. But you can't be 100% uh, certain, and you've heard me tell you this story before when MacArthur came out with his first book really articulating all of this, which was called The Gospel According to Jesus, that it was promoted at the Christian Booksellers Convention, which that year, which was about 88, I think, uh, and, and in Dallas, and there was a pretty good Christian bookstore in Irving where I lived, and they would have these events where they would invite pastors and they would have breakfast for them. And MacArthur spoke, and there wasn't enough room for everybody, so a bunch of us were sitting on the floor, and Tommy Ice and I were sitting on the floor right in front of MacArthur and right inside the sneeze thing. They didn't really have one, I just say that. We were that close. And at the end, I asked him, because of the statements he made, I said, well, Dr. MacArthur, how certain are you that if you died right now that you'll go to heaven? And he said, mm, about 98% sure. See, that's all you get because your evidence of assurance comes from the fruit in your life, not from the promise of God. That's part of the problem with lordship, lordship salvation. And so he's been, you know, there's a lot of good things that I've heard MacArthur teach, a lot of good things that he has said and done. He's become very popular on some, he was on Larry King quite a few times. And he was always defending the, the gospel. And he didn't get into it in a lordship way, so unless you knew what he was saying, uh, you, would, you, you wouldn't miss, I mean, you'd, unless you knew what he said, you'd miss, miss it. But he was always defending the integrity of Scripture the absolute truth of Scripture. You've got to respect somebody like that, even if they're off in some, other, in some other areas. So you have these different views I pointed out last time that salvation, they look at it as salvation, it's either phase one justification, God began a good work, that's regeneration. And they'll use that to say regeneration precedes faith. Or phase two, it's sanctification, where the believer is going to grow. God began it when he regenerated them after they believed, but they're going to grow or not grow, but God's going to bring them to glorification. And it doesn't necessarily, phase, the phase two idea doesn't necessarily involve lordship. But this other view, and I've run into several more scholarly commentaries that take this view this week, that... Uh, Paul writes of a singular good work, not a plural good works. So he's talking about something different. He's not talking about the good works for, that you get, um, for example, as a result of uh, uh, salvation, which we see in Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, plural. It's singular here in, uh, in Ephesians uh, one um, one six, we, he began a, a good work in you. So the basic problems with this view is um, I think I, I was changing slides, so I didn't get rid of that one. So here's the basic organization where I am at this point. <clears throat> 
you have the whole introduction is 1 through 26. You have the f introduction proper in verses 1 through 11, and then more of a personal introduction in 12 to 26. And then you get into the main body, and then the conclusion is 4, 10 to 20. And the f they mirror each other, just like James. It's, uh, I was studying this. I said, this is just like James. James 1, 1 through 17 introduces vocabulary and concepts that are not mentioned in the body, and, but they're all mentioned again in the end. It, it's a, a beautifully written and organized epistle. Well, last time we had to talk about this basic issue of what does fellowship mean, and I think this is important because too often you have heard fellowship be defined as, partner, as, a, as social interaction. And we hear it that way on the street. But that's not what fellowship means biblically. It's much more than that. It is not simply um, social interaction. It is not even social interaction among believers engaged in uh, discussion about the Bible or discussion about, about Scripture. Fellowship has the idea of, of partnership, of people who are going to have the same goal, they're going in the same direction, and they are working together to get there. So that's a great way of understanding the metaphor we have in Scripture that we're to walk by the Spirit. We're going in the same direction, and when we stop walking by the Spirit, it's because we've done it about face and we're going in the other direction. So, and then we have to confess sin to reverse, uh, reverse course. And so this is, this is a great way to understand this. And we have forms of this word. The basic word is koinonia. And then we have also used several times in, uh, if he, I mean, in Philippians, su koinonia. This is the preposition sun, which means with, so, or together with. So it, it just intensifies the idea of this fellowship with one another. And so those are these key ideas. But then last time I went through a lot of the verses, if you remember, that, are tra that translate one of these koinonia words. And there are quite a few of them that talk about giving, translated as contribution, sharing financially. So that, that's an important thing that I don't that was a... Uh, new idea for me. I had not realized it was used that way that precisely. So we had ex have examples here like in Philippians 1.7 where Paul uses soon koinonos, the noun, he says that it's right for me to think this of you all because I have you in my heart. This is a very personal verse here. You, he, he has a close relationship with the Philippians. He, he cares deeply about them. He says, and I need to be concerned about you in this because I have you in my heart. I'm, in other words, I'm, I think a lot about you and I think uh, much of you. In as much as both in my chains, that means he's in prison in Rome, in my chains and he's under house arrest, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. That's soon coined in us. Then it, it, it's, you see the other side, Philippians 4.15. Now pay attention to this verse. This is a really important verse. There's stuff buried here that we miss. He sa says it's coming to the end of the epistle. And he says, now you Philippians... Know also that in the beginning of the gospel, what does he mean by that? Is this the beginning of, of, of the presentation of the gospel? Well, the gospel's been going on for a long time. You had the gospel in the Old Testament. You had the gospel of the, uh, of the kingdom in the, in, in the period of the gospels, the period of the incarnation. Is this the beginning of the church age gospel when the church age began in Acts 2? What does he mean when he says... Uh, in the beginning of the gospel. He's talking about in the beginning of their, per he's, it's just shorthand, in the beginning of their participation in or for the gospel ministry, which he had just 
uh, which he had stated at the beginning of the epistle. Uh, and he says, at the, in, at, or, when, you know also that in the beginning of the gospel, and then he defines it, when I departed from Macedonia. Well, that's not the beginning of the gospel. That's the beginning of their participation in his gospel ministry. It was when he departed from Macedonia. Where did he go from? And, and where was he in Macedonia? He's at Philippi. So where does he go from there? Well, where he goes from there is to Thessalonica. And so he walked down to Thessalonica, and he spent about two months in Thessalonica. He initially started in the synagogue. After two or three weeks, they kicked him out, and so then the believers met separately. And so he said, when I departed from Macedonia, not when I got to Thessalonica, not when I got to Berea, which was the next one online, not when I got down to Athens or when I got to Corinth, he says, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared, there's our word koinonia, no church partnered with me, no church participated with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. That means none of these other churches that he started are sending him a penny to help him and to defray the cost of his ministry other than the Philippians. And the word there for sharing financially with Paul to support his ministry is the word koinonia, for fellowship. So when we look at that closing section, Philippians 4, 14 in the New King James says, Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress, that is, his imprisonment, the ESV, English Standard Version, fairly recent translation, said, he says, you, it was kind of you to share my trouble. And then they have this note. Uh, they have a little uh, A by the word share, and they have this note in the margin of the ESV that says share means to have fellowship in Paul's adversity. We don't think of it, fellowship as something you have in adversity. We think of fellowship too often as some sort of social interaction. But it is, it, they're partnering, they're participating in Paul's adversity. They're helping him carry the load, as it were. And so he says, you have done well. Now, the word for, uh, you've done well that you shared in my distress. And the word there is this long word, sukon and neo, it's a participle, you have done well, that's their main verb, it's an aorist tense, it's a past tense, and so is the uh, participle, and there's a basic rule in Greek, I mean these rules on participles are pretty much, um, there, there are no, no exceptions. If you have an aorist tense verb and an aorist tense participle, the participle either happens at the same time as the verb or it happens before the verb. Here it would be at the same time when they did well in the past that what they did well was they were sharing. That's what they did. They participated in Paul's uh, ministry. Then in the next verse, which we read a little earlier, 4.15, he says, no church shared with me. So they shared, but no ch other churches shared with me and this is the uh, active indicative form of this verb. No other church gave money or contributed or were partners in his, in his ministry. So it's very clear that the concept of fellowship in Philippians is not social interaction. They're not just praying for Paul. They are financially committed to making sure they can do what they uh, what they can, and we're going to read. We're going to go over to Second Corinthians eight to understand where Paul brags on them in order to uh, give a positive example to the Corinthians who are not doing any giving. So we go back to the beginning. He says, "For your partnership for the gospel." 
from the first day until now. And so when we, when we take a look at this and we're trying to understand what goes on in this particular passage in uh, Philippians 1.5, um, we have this ace clause, E-I-S, and that is translated in the gospel, but that's ambiguous, and it's not really good. Ace means for or with or toward something. And so you have this same word, koinonia, used with an ace clause in Romans 15, 26, and in 2 Corinthians 9, 13. And in Romans 15, 26, it's talking about a contribution. It's financial. A contribution for the poor. It's not in. It's for the poor. And in 2 Corinthians 9, 13, it's translated liberal sharing or liberal giving. Generous giving. So again, it's a financial concept in 2 Corinthians 9, 13. Uh, liberal sharing, and here it's with them. So this phraseology is really important because the way we normally read this in the New King James or in most of the other tra modern translations, New American Standard, NIV, or ESV, any of those, it translates it pretty much traditionally. You all know why they have a tendency to not change too radically what the translation is, don't you? They won't sell any Bibles. It's a business. You have to print the Bibles. That costs money. They're going to sell the Bibles. But it, that happened when the RSV came out because they, uh, back in the 50s when the R Revised Standard Version came out, in Isaiah 7.14, they translated Parthenos, the word for virgin, as maiden. Now, no evangelical conservative wanted to see that, that, that the Messiah was going to be born from a maiden and not a virgin. So all the conservatives were up in arms, and nobody bought the RSV because of that. So uh, they, the publisher lost a lot of money. Or maybe they just didn't make any money. But it was a huge issue. So this word now, we, we change, I hope, our understanding of what the Bible talks about with fellowship. That number one, it's not doesn't have anything to do with social interaction, whether it's with believers or not with believers. It has to do with a partnership toward a common goal, which should be spiritual growth and edification. Philippians 1.5 then says, uh, gives a time frame and says, that he's thankful for their partnership for the gospel from the first day until, until now. Well, what happens here is a couple of things that we need to pay attention to. First of all, he's not talking about them individually. He's talking about the church as a corporate entity. We've seen that a lot in our study of, of Ephesians on Sunday morning. They're talking about the body of Christ as an entity and not talking about necessarily two individuals. It doesn't exclude individual application, but the focal point is what you as a body of believers are doing in a local church. And we're going to see this when we on Sunday morning. We're shifting to the next section in Ephesians 4.17. And that's a passage that I've been wrestling with for at least two years because of the language that's there, realizing that there's a, probably a good chance that how I've understood that for the last 40 years is wrong. And we have to understand it under the rubric that we've been seeing all through Ephesians that this is corporate and not individual. And that's going to rattle our cages a little bit. Well, this is corporate. He's thankful to the congregation because they're taking up a collection and they're not, it's not individual envelopes from different people and different families. It's one gift from the whole congregation. So it's, it's, it's corporate. And so these ideas about individual issues related to unity and related to suffering and related to um, the gospel are secondary ideas that this is talking about this, 
uh, the fact that the church needs to be unified and is unified in this process of, of giving. So it can't be talking about individual salvation. From the beginning of now, it can't be talking about when each one of you get first got saved and were regenerate. It's talking about the beginning of, of what? Well, what we saw in 415. It's the beginning of their financial contribution to Paul once he left Macedonia on his way to Thessalonica. They are contributing. So that this is really not talking about some sort of individual phase one salvation or individual phase two salvation. This is talking about their participation in partnership with Paul financially uh, in the gospel. So from the first day, the congregation, at, from the very beginning of his, at, of his trip, after he, le he left uh, Philippi, they're sending financial contributions. And so in uh, Philippians 1.6 then, he goes on to say, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So the good work that's beginning isn't the good work of regeneration or the good work of spiritual growth. It's the good work of being a financial partner in Paul's, uh, Paul's ministry. And Another observation we should make is if it's talking about individual salvation and individual partnership with, with um, I mean, in terms of their spiritual growth, when does that end? When does your spiritual growth end? Absent from the body, face to face with the Lord. Phase three. What does he say in the verse? until the day of Christ. So what he's talking about here is that, that God is completing the work he began with them then, and he's going to complete it in the second century, third century, fourth century, fifth century, all the way down to the 20th and the 21st centuries, until the day of Christ. So that which they are... Um, bearing that, that which they are doing to help Paul is going to bear fruit from generation to generation to generation, and that all accrues to them in terms of rewards at, at the judgment seat of Christ, which is what we'll see the day of Christ is, is, um, is referencing. The other thing we should see is when you have this verse 6 that is talking about beginning a good work, that verse is sandwiched between verse 5 and verse 7. And in verse 5 and verse 7, the focal point is on this partnership with the gospel ministry. So in, if you have this, these brackets talking about partnership in the gospel ministry, you, and it's all part of the same sentence, the middle section is not going to talk about something that is uh, that is completely different. So what he's writing here is he wants them to have this unity because there's a lack of unity, but in order for this corporate partnership, for the church's partnership with his gospel ministry to be uh, effective as much as it can, the people have to quit bickering and have to, have, have to be unified. Now, we've talked a lot about unity over in Ephesians 4. Unity doesn't mean they have to agree that they, that they all have to be the same, they all have to act the same way, or they all have to have the same opinions. But it does mean that they're unified on the basics of Scripture and the basics of, uh, of doctrine, the basics of the gospel and who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. So what he says is he, he began a good work, and uh, I ran across this quote I thought I'd throw up here to show that that A, I've done my homework, and B, this isn't something I'm just inventing out of thin air. This is um, Hawthorne, who is the author of the volume, the commentary on Philippians in the Word Biblical Commentary series, which is a highly respected scholarly um, uh, commentary series. He says, quote, rather, ergon agathon, that's the Greek for good work, singular, singular, 
finds its explanation in the fact that the Philippians were partners with Paul in the gospel. Verse 5. And shared their resources with him to make the proclamation of the gospel possible. This sharing in the gospel is the good work referred to here. And then he references 2 Corinthians 8.6. I guess we'll have to go to 2 Corinthians 8.6. And look at that passage. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 is the most thorough discussion of giving in the New Testament. And there's a lot there. And the similarities of language with what we find in, in the beginning and the end of, of Philippians is really amazing. So we look at 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 8, 6. And Paul is writing, so we urged Titus. Titus was one of his trainees that he was working with, who be, later became pastor of church in Crete. So we urged Titus that as he had begun, so he would also complete this grace in you as well. So what we have in Philippians 1 is we're confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will, what? Complete it. So you have those two words uh, here and in um, Philippians 1.6 that show a similarity. We urge Titus that as he had begun, and this is the word on the left, uh, pra and erkomai, which has the idea basically to begin something. And then the word for complete is the word on the right, epiteleo. We run into teleo and teleos a lot, and that we know that means complete or to bring to completion or to bring to maturity. So this is found right in the middle of this long two-chapter discussion on giving. And Paul is encouraging the Corinthians with their giving. So we're just going to read our way through chapter 8, down to about verse 12. I'm not going to take you through 8 and 9. So he says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God. Now that's not talking about salvation. It's talking about giving. Grace giving. The, the word for grace uh, is used uh, six times in, in this uh, passage in chapters 8 and, and chapters 9. So he said, uh, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God which, has, which had already been given, past tense. This has already happened, the giving of God's grace to the churches in Macedonia. Now, who lives in Macedonia? The Philippians. He said, we, we've made known to you the grace of God, which has already been given in the past uh, among the churches in Macedonia, that in a great trial or test of affliction. So they're going through adversity testing. They're going through a situation where maybe the money is being devalued and they're seeing the rising costs of fuel and food and all kinds of other things that they can't afford. And uh, we don't know if they went through a famine or what the situation is, but, but they were having a, a financial test. He says, in a great trial of affliction, I love the way this verse reads. There's so many opposites here. In a great trial of, afflic of affliction, the abundance of their whining. Oh, that isn't what it says. That, that must be somebody in Houston. In a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and, then, and their deep poverty. I mean, they're just not poor. They are in deep poverty. They don't know how they're going to put a, a, a gallon of gas in their car in the next week. The abundance of their joy and their deep poverty. So you have affliction and joy, then poverty, and then riches. Abounded in the riches of their liberality or their generosity. So they weren't sitting there going, well, you know, I'm losing a lot of money right now because the stock market's down, my 401k is down, 
Uh, I don't have the money. I'm not uh, uh, gas prices, food prices, everything else is going up, and I'm being squeezed. So, well, I guess the first thing we'll do is cut how much money I'm giving to the church or to missions or whatever. That's not the that's not their attitude. He says in the trial of and affliction, the abundance of their joy and the deep and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their generosity. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. Verse 4, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift. How many times, you know, somebody's really poor? Say, no, 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 no. I know you can't afford it. Don't, don't give it to me. And that they're, they're begging, Paul, you take this money. We're giving it to you. Receive the gift and the fellowship, koinonia. That relates to this financial offering. The fellowship of the ministering to the saints. I'm saying, okay, Paul, we read some of that letter to, that you wrote to the Ephesians. And that said that you're equipping us to do the work of ministry. Part of the work of ministry is making sure you've got food on the table and you can take care of your financial needs. And so we have taken up a collection and we're giving it to you so that you can pay the bills. That's our ministry. You trained us to do this. That's the partnership of the ministry. Same word as you have in Ephesians 4.11 to the saints. And then Paul says, and not only as we had hoped, see, he's really blasting the Corinthians with this because they're not doing this. He's using the, the, what the Philippians are doing as an example of what the Corinthians ought to be doing. And the Corinthians are saying, well, we're going through this hard economic times. There's a recession. We just, we just don't have the money. And so Paul goes, well, look at the Philippians. They don't have the money either. And look how much they're coming up with. He says, and not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Notice the order there. See, this is, when you hear go to churches and you hear these, these awful sermons where they're haranguing the people and dunning the people for all kinds of money, for all kinds of pet projects and everything else, they're not dealing with it on a spiritual basis. There's an order here. First, you have to give yourself to the Lord. In other words, you have to go from being a spiritual baby to recognizing there are some inherent responsibilities in the Christian life. doesn't mean that your salvation is dependent upon it, but that you're responsible to grow. And if you're not responsible to grow, Paul's going to call you some dirty names. He's going to call you a little baby like he did the Corinthians, that you have to grow up and mature. So he said, first they gave themselves to the Lord. They were committed to walking worthy of the, of the Lord, of the calling with which they have been called. They first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us. See, what happens is a lot of people think giving is, oh, first I'm going to give to the church, and then I've got to figure out where I am in my relationship with the Lord. So first thing, you've got to get your relationship to the Lord right, and then as a consequence of that, then, there's spirit, then you decide what you're going to do with the uh, treasure and the talents that God has given you. And that's the context for what Paul says in verse 6, which is what, what I mentioned. So we urge Titus that as he had begun, begun what? Begun in his ministry, not begun in his Christian life, but begun in his missionary endeavors. So he would also complete this grace in you as well. Grace related to spiritual life, spiritual growth. Verse 7, but as you, that is you Corinthians, as you abound in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, and in all diligence. Remember, they had all the spiritual gifts and more. They were making them up. Uh, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. What's this grace? It's the giving from the right vantage point where first you give yourself to the Lord and then to support Paul. Paul. 
Verse 8, I speak not by commandment. See, it's grace. It's an individual decision, your individual responsibility. I speak not by commandment, but I am evaluating the sincerity of your love. See, I think most translations translate that word as testing. It's dokimazo. It, it's an evaluation to show, the, to show what's good and not what's lacking. It's the same word that's used at the, for the judgment seat of Christ in 1 Corinthians 13, that God is exposing the gold, silver, and precious sto stones. He's not exposing the wood, hay, and straw. That's what, what's burned up. I am evaluating the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. Paul's saying, I, I know other believers like in Philippi, and they don't have what you have, and so maybe you better check things. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, that is rich because he is in heaven and with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, he has everything Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. He entered into this cesspool of Satan's world. He became poor that you through his poverty might become rich. Not financially rich, but rich in terms of the abundant life. And so Paul then says, and in this I give advice, it is to your advantage not only to be doing what you began and were desiring to do a year ago. See, so that must refer to their desire to financially contribute. So you see this beginning. We've seen it in Philippians. We've seen it with Titus. And we see it here. And it's not talking about regeneration, the beginning of your Christian life. Remember, this is 2 Corinthians. Actually, it's probably 3 Corinthians. There was a, there's two epistles that are alluded to that didn't, that weren't kept, that weren't part of the scripture. And so you really have 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians got lost, so then 3 Corinthians became 2 Corinthians, and then 4 Corinthians got lost. Are you confused now? Uh, so that's what he, so, so in all of that, if he's writing this in 2 Corinthians about something they started a year ago, well, it's been a couple of years or more since he wrote 1 Corinthians, and it's been a couple of years before that that he was there. So they should have been grown. In, in 1 Corinthians, he got all over them because he said, You're three, years, three years ago I was here, and you should be mature by now. 2 Corinthians 8, 11, But now you all also must complete the doing of it. See, there's that. God's going to bring it to completion. It, it's, it's not the regeneration to maturity. It has to do with uh, bringing to completion the mission of giving. Now you also must complete the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to desire it, so there also may be a completion out of what you have. And I could go through this. We could take about four weeks. I'm not going to do it. And we could go through all the parallels between 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 and, this, and uh, Philippians 1, uh, 5 through 7. So it's their, their financial issues. So what we see just summarizes, we have two key words in Philippians and 2 Corinthians 8, 6, that in conjunction with one another, focus fellowship on financial contribution. Okay, those, those are the words to uh, begin and to um, uh, begin a good work, the word begin and then to complete it. Those two words connect the dots. Second, thing that we said is that in the epistle to the Corinthians, the example for giving is the Philippian church. The poor people down there in Philippi who are going through all kinds of problems, and yet they're giving out of their poverty. Verse 3, these two chapters in 2 Corinthians have all the major ideas which are in Philippians 1.6, and in the conclusion in chapter 4. And then last, we see that the term good work of Philippians 1.6 is also used, singular, is also used in 2 Corinthians 9.8. And God is able to make all grace, it's used eight times 
in 8 and 9. God is able to make all grace abound to you. That's because God's sufficient. That you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. Not plural. Good work. So you have the same phrase, agathos ergon, that you have in Philippians 1.6. Second, um, and then that's what you have, and it goes until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, what does that describe? Well, William Hendrickson, who has a lot of interesting stuff, well studied, a lot of interesting information in his commentaries. In his commentary on Philippians, and remember, he's reformed, he's Amil, Lordship, all of those things. He, he gives this list. This is what the day of Christ refers to. He just blends all these things together. He doesn't recognize there's a distinction between the day of the Lord or the, and the day of Christ. But, the, but he has this summary here. You have the phrase day of Christ in Philippians 1.10, and we'll run into it again in Philippians 2.16. Has the phrase, the day of our Lord Jesus. And there's a textual variant there for Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 1.8 and 2 Corinthians 1.14, those passages are talking about one distinct event, which is the rapture, which is immediately followed by the judgment seat of Christ. Then you have the other passages in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 2 Thessalonians 1 and 2, the day of the Lord, the day and that day, those are describing judgment. That's what the day of the Lord is. So the day of the Lord is not the same as the day of Christ. The day of Christ is when the Jesus Christ uh, returns to this earth in order to get, uh, not to the earth rather, returns in the air to gather to himself his church. That's at the rapture, which is immediately followed by the judgment, judgment seat of Christ. So he's going to use this again in Philippians 1.10, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Now, that makes the day of Christ sound like a positive thing and not a negative thing. Day of the Lord is a real negative thing. Uh, Philippians 2.16, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. I don't know anybody who's going to be rejoicing in the day of the Lord. That's the, the tribulation period. Uh, the day of the Lord. Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 1.8, who will also confirm you to the end that may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's talking about the reward aspect that occurs with the judgment seat of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 1.14, as also you have understood us in part, that we are your boast as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. So that's talking about the rapture and then the judgment seat of Christ which follows. So the day of Christ is different from the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord describes the horrible time of judgment culminating in the battle of Armageddon. The day of Christ is when Christ comes for his own at the rapture which is immediately followed by the judgment seat of Christ when we are rewarded. So back to our passage. The reference to the day of Christ in 1.6 is mirrored by the fact that Paul is saying that because of their financial partnership with him, the fruit of that abounds to their account. That account is going to be checked at the judgment seat of Christ. So then we come to Philippians 1.7, where Paul, this is a very intimate statement about his care and concern for the Philippians. He says, just as it's right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart. Now, the word heart has a lot of meanings in English, not all of which apply to Greek. But it's the idea of the center of something, and it really relates to our soul and primarily to the thinking part of the soul. 
And so he's thinking about them. That's what he's saying in a, in a more intimate way than just saying, I think about you. I think about you in my heart. It indicates a more intimate concern. And he says, inasmuch as both in my chains, and that's just a metaphor for his imprisonment. I don't think he was in chains in, under house arrest in Rome. But that doesn't mean that he wasn't at, time, uh, 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 that at some times from that whole two-year period at Caesarea after he's arrested in Jerusalem, and then you have the period on the ship and the shipwreck, and then he's finally taken to Rome. Um, so he just uses that to, as a metaphor for his imprisonment. And in the defense, that is the apologia, the defense of the gospel, it's a legal defense. I think it's a little bit of a double entendre here because he's going to have to have a legal defense before the Caesar, and it's a defense of his gospel ministry and refuting the charges of the legalistic uh, Pharisees and Sadducees in Jerusalem. And then the word uh, confirmation. And the word confirmation here, here's the apologia, and the word for confirmation has the idea of this process of establishing or confirming something or validating it. So the two words together, he's giving a legal defense of the truth of the gospel, validating it as absolute reality. And as he concludes that, he says, you all are partakers with me of grace. Your partners in this whole operation. And then he concludes, For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And so he uses a standard phrase, the bowels of Christ, the entrails. See, when you feel something deeply, you feel it in your gut. Right? That, so they would refer to compassion with this term that relates to your kidneys. So with, but that's what it means is deeply felt affection that he has for uh, the Philippians. And so this takes us down to uh, through verse 8, and then next time we'll look at the rest of this opening introduction in verses 9 to 11. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to look at these things and to be challenged with our understanding of fellowship challenged in the area of giving, challenged in the area of uh, making sure that our focal point is first and foremost to honor and glorify you and serve you, and then second to carry out whatever other ministries of giving or teaching or helping or whatever it may be, that that second first we give ourselves to you. We pray you would challenge us with this in Christ's name. Amen.